right, so tell the world who you are and what you do, brother. I'm Steve Wall from uh, Black Powder Breeding and Huntsman. And uh, we, uh, we, hunt, uh, we hunt with the Patterdales. We hunt with the pit bulls too also. But we uh, hunt mostly with Patterdales, uh, above ground, mostly above ground. If they go below ground, we'll, we'll get them in there, get, out of, get them out of there. But um, mostly above ground, fox, raccoon, I let them chase deer sometimes, stuff like that. They can't do nothing with it. Never coyote. But uh, that's basically what we do. We do animal control, too. I have an animal control company, Pac-Man Animal Control, where we do a lot of um, agricultural pest control and stuff like that, orchards, barns, and things like that. Mm. That's, basically, that's basically about right there. Where, where are you located? We're located down here in, in Georgia, in Augusta. Well, we're located in Augusta now, but most of our, um, most of the, the, the farms that we uh, cater to and we work on is uh, down in um, Rins, Rins, Jefferson, well, Jefferson County, um, and, and a little bit south of Augusta here. Mm. So when you say... Um when you say pit bulls, are you talking about uh, game dogs or the working pit bull dogs? Well, yeah. Well, they came from game bred line, you know. But we don't, uh, you know, we don't roll them or nothing like that. We just strictly keep them for, you know, the hogs. We okay. started them out on. Uh, they were, they were, they were, they were one with my brother's pet for a while. We started them out on um, baby hog, and he did really well. And uh, he moved up to the big boys uh, real quick. You know, so he, he he's got about maybe two or three catches on the um, the larger size hogs and stuff like that. Mm. But uh, we we mostly we, we, we run them on hogs. We're gonna start getting into the deer dogs. We have a program coming up on some lurchers and stuff like that. Now, for the people who don't know, what exactly is a lurcher? Lurcher is uh, it's a uh, stag hound or, or deer hound or it, it's sight hound we'll say sight hound mixed with the uh the pit bull they have that um you know that tenacity of uh getting the, getting there to get the job done and then once they get there you know that that that, that pit bull take over inside and they they want to you know take it down and hold it down and everything like that so you have the uh, aggression of the pit bull with the speed and tenacity of this of the sight hound, which is most likely going to be a stag hound or um, a, a greyhound or something like that. Okay. So tell me, tell me the story. When did you get involved, and in, and in what made you choose the breeds you chose? Oh, I've been I've been in the dogs for you know since I was a kid. I used to run for a guy who uh, who had a uh, game bred you know fighting pitch, and I would you know next door neighbor. You know, watch my dog while I'm gone, take him out to, to you know, water and feed him, you know, take him out for little walks and stuff like that, you know, and um, so I've always been into dogs, and my dad used to, he used to breed um, Dobermans, so I was, you know, always around dogs, but I got into Patterdales about, we'll say about 10 years ago, I got into Patterdales because, um, we were doing it. In, the, in, the, in the city that I'm from up north, there's a lot of rats, a lot of backyard raccoons, parks and stuff like that. And, um, you know, people can't get rid of them. People are trying to poison them, which is illegal, and people trying to do all types of stuff, but they can't. So, you know, already knowing how the, the, the pit bulls were, we wanted to run on the raccoons and stuff with the pit bulls, but the city actually bans pit bulls. So we were looking for... Um, a, a, a smaller, tougher dog that we could uh, put on the raccoons and, you know, do some, some catching and stuff like that. So we got into uh, looking at the Patterdales and uh, soon after that, we, you know, started looking to buy Patterdales to, to work with them. And um, that, that that's how I got into it right there. Just, you know, just doing that type of work for, uh, for more, it was more, I can't say for fun, it was more for, you know, the pleasure of having, working with the dogs. It's more for the pleasure of working with the dog, but uh, we quickly turned it to, you know, business-wise and and, and and doing things like that. We started the the, the um, pest 
control company, and after that, we took off. So explain to me, <clears throat> I've always been really, really interested in the Patterdale. Explain to me some of the differences in the Patterdale compared to, say, the game Pitbull Terrier. Is, uh, you know that's 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 over in Europe. That's an English Irish thing, mostly. But um, from what I understand, they were all most of the dogs were uh, you know even no matter what the size, small or big, they were all going in the ground, mostly for badger and fox and things like that. So um, they, they 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 have that tenacity and they have that you know it's a terrier, so they they they're gonna want to start trouble anyways. Mm. But um. They, they had that, that tenacity to where they, they, they want to go and nothing's going to stop them. It's the same thing with the pit bull, you know. You know how pit bulls are. Pit bulls, once they, 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 they get interested in getting at something, they don't want to stop. They start to whining, they jump in, and then if you let them go, you know, you see what they're all about. So we got um, the, the pattern they basically seems like the same thing. I know a lot of guys, especially over in um, over in Europe, they mix the um, the Patterdales with the uh, with the Bulldogs. You know, the Battle Cross is there, and they bring them back down to Patterdale. But uh, we were more interested in keeping it more Patterdale. We didn't want to mix it with the Bulldogs and stuff like that. Keeping the lineage of everything and keeping it uh, as pure as you can get, even though they say a Patterdale is a purebred dog. Mm. Yeah. Now, are you familiar with the, with the Yag Terrier? Yes, I am. What well, would you say, there is there any differences, really, or are they pretty much the same kind of dog? If, uh, Yag Terriers, I think, are harder dogs. They, they, they're, um, I, I haven't seen a lot of Yag Terriers with callback. You know what I mean? I have callback, good callback on the Patterdales. You know, they see a couple of coyotes. They want to go, and uh, you know, once I get loud and hey, hey, here, 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 you know, call them back. It's it's a no go. Um, Yag Terriers, it, it will be a totally different thing. Totally different. Yag Terriers are hard dogs. It just every Yag Terrier I've seen is a hard dog. So, for the guys listening who would want to get into Patterdales, what would you, where would you tell them to start? What advice would you give them? Uh, I know a lot of people say that uh, Patterdales, you know, you have to get them from working lines. I really don't believe that. My dog came from a, from a, a, a they came they're from working lines, yes, but they, their parents were farm dogs. They weren't hunters every day. They just ran around the farm you know, freely and caught and killed whatever they wanted to do. So that is a plus to have them from that, but I don't think that is what you have to have in because if you're if you're hunt training with your dog and you're out there and you're giving them plenty of practice plenty plenty of practice and stuff like that, you'll 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 develop and you'll see what you need to eat in the dog. You know, sometimes it'll take, sometimes it won't. You know what I mean? So it's you know, you gotta be very um you don't want to cur them out. You don't want to, you know, uh, scare them, scare them in any way or anything like that. You don't want to force them in the ground. If they want to go in the ground, they'll go in the ground. But what I recommend is to look for a nice, solid dog. I, I, I like dogs that are bigger, 20 pounds, 25 pounds. Right. If they get bigger, I'll still work with them. But um, get you a nice, solid dog, nice, solid bone structure. They have that tenacity. They have that aggression. Mm. You know, that like that. That's what you want to look for. You want to start out with that. And it's constant practice. Constant, even if it's on the fur in the yard, if you're taking them out by one by one to chase squirrels just to get a, you know, see where they're at and stuff like that, that's what you need to do. You know, you need to, uh, you know, pay attention to the dog and what the dog wants to do, not what you want the dog to do. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, as far as, um, now I don't, again, I don't know much about the Patterdale, but, um, what are some of the famous bloodlines? Like, you know, when I talk about the pit bulls or the bullies, I, I know about a lot of bloodlines. What are some of the bloodlines of Patterdales to look out for? Oh, I, well, I have Middleton Gould bloodlines, um, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping those tight. I, I have a, 
a tight program. I did, did a brother's just breathing that I'm going to uh, that I'm going to keep that blood going on that because I like how they're, they're pretty smart. They have the nice bone structure and stuff like that. But um, you have Coop, you have um, you know, like I said, Milton Gould. You have it, there's a lot of different lines out there. You, it's mostly for from what I'm seeing now and, and, and watching the guys out there who have the padded deals. It's more about the stature because I see a lot of uh, a lot of guys like the smaller dogs. So if they only breed small dogs to small dogs to get the smaller dog to go on the ground. But if you know, if you pay attention to the lines that you're that you're looking into, you know, getting, you you you'll see the stat the stature of the dogs, and uh, that's the big thing to me, the stature of the dog, because um, I don't want to put a a 10, 15 pound dog up against a you know a 30 pound guy. I mean a um, 30 pound fox or or a 30 pound 35 pound um, raccoon, you know, something like that. You know, if you're going on something that's going to roll over and lay down like a possum, hey, cool, but definitely got to uh, look at the stature of the dog, and um, you know, it is you do want to pay attention to where they came from as far as if they're a working line, you don't want really no, no couch breeders, but um, definitely uh, look at the stature of the dog it's temperament, you know, so they, but Temperament doesn't always mean you have a hard dog because I have a female here. My 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 matriarch, she's uh she's a couch dog, but if you open the door, anything that moves, she's on it, and she doesn't care. Okay. Uh, she doesn't. Uh, she didn't. She just uh she just lost the way she didn't lose eyes. She lost some vision in her eye. She just got out of fault about two months ago. I opened the door for her to go out, thinking it was cool for her to go out off the leash. She was right behind the fox in the, in the, in the woods. So mm. it's all about, you know, it's, like I said, it's what they want to do. If you have a dog that wants to do it, you know, you nurture him. You you, you, you go with him. If he runs in the woods, you run there behind him. Don't call him back, run there behind him, catch up to him, you know? Okay. Well, now, one thing I've always wondered, and this might seem like a funny question, but I... I ask all questions. <laughs> um, I've always said to people that live in like an apartment and they have a weight limit um, on as far as what kind of dogs they have. I guess this is a two part question. Do you think number one that a pair of Patterdales um, <clears throat> can have an equivalent hit? to to a different to a decent sized bulldog and number two do you think that a pair of patterdales in the right circumstances would become man focused to protect their owner absolutely they, they work well as a pack they work well as a pack i have uh two brothers and, 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 a, and a half brother and they, they first when they got together they fought 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 all the time I forced them to stay together. I kept breaking up the fights. And no matter what, if one gets into something, the other one is right there to have his back. It used to be uh, um, um, they wanted all the glory, so they would attack each other to get it to prey. Now they just team up on him and just tear it apart. No matter what it is. If, he, someone, if someone's wrestling and they're mouth to mouth, someone has the tail, someone's at the gut. It's always, you know, a, a, a double or triple team when it comes to it. As far as, and, and, and yes, they, they hit hard. They, they, they hit hard. They, they hit very hard. They hit hard. I can tell you that right now. You know, there's no call back once they're on the prey. There's no call back. It's, it's over. It's over. Either you get in there and you break it up and you call the prey, or, 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 or you know, it's, it's going to keep going until someone's dead. And uh, most likely, if you have a few different patterns on them and they're hitting hard, they're probably going to be without the players, most likely. Okay. Yeah, that was always something I wondered because um, I get constant emails from people about, uh, like, oh, well, I, I live in an apartment and, you know, is there a smaller bloodline of pit bull I can get or is there something I can get, you know? Well, as far as living in an apartment, <laughs> I... I wouldn't recommend people who live in an apartment to have the padded ales unless they're going to be caged up all the time because they're going to tear your shit up. Okay. They're going to tear it up. They're going to make dens. 
they're gonna find spaces that they like, they're gonna find things that they do like, and they're gonna they're gonna make it theirs. And another thing too that I noticed, they are extremely needy. Panadale is extremely needy. Like I said, my, I, my my matriarch bitch here, when I first got her, she was, you know, she was out with us all the time. So she wasn't used to um, being alone in the house. So now when you leave the house and you leave her in the house, she looks for, you know, that, that separation anxiety. She looks to tear things up. Mm. With these other dogs here, they were raised in kennel. So, you know what I mean? So they, they were raised... They see you when you come feed them. They see you when you take them out. But they're not with you all the time. So the separation anxiety is totally different. When I turn around and leave the house, they, they you know, they'll, they'll bark for two or three minutes. But they'll lay down. When I come back in, they'll wake up, bark, and then that's it. Where she, you know, she'll, um, she, she, she needs that attention all the time. I have to leave her with my mom. You know, she, I leave her with my mom. She doesn't work anymore. She's done. She's just breathing and hang out with mom. Eat crackers. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, once they earn their keep, there's nothing wrong with that, man. Yeah, they, they will attack. I tell you that too. They, when they, um, all my boys have, uh, they, they, they've tasted the blood of man already. All three of my boys have tasted the blood of man already. Not on purpose, but by accident. You know, um, friends coming by thinking, "Oh, I'm cool with the dog. I'm cool with the dogs." And you know, they get that shifty eye and turn around and snap a finger or, or bite an ankle or something like that. And then, you know, you know you're really not cool with the dog. But, yeah, they, um, they're very, very protective, sometimes overprotective. Now, when it, when it comes down to, to those instances, did they... Somebody hit the door right there. So, when they, when they did go at man... What was it like? Was it kind of like, okay, because I've seen smaller dogs like, say, chihuahuas and little little schnauzers and, and things like that, little mixes. I've seen them go at, man, they'll bite and then back off. Were these guys more forward than that? They were way more forward. So what happened was it was the contact with my boys that caused them to. So, you know, you could, you know they pull up, they come in the house, come in the garage, as soon as you get the, you know, the handshake with the, the handshake with the, with the hug, that was it. That was enough for them to attack. <laughs> that was enough for them to go off. What's going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. Smacked the hand, gave him a little hug. Two of my boys came out, you know, they came out of nowhere. They was hanging out. They were laying on the cool floor. They came out of nowhere. Someone hit the um, calf. Someone hit the hand. Ripped his hand open, he had to get 10 stitches in his hand and uh, three or four stitches on his calf, right up over the kidneys, too. Damn. Yeah. No, no charges pressed, though, you know. He, he knew what, what it was. He was like, yeah, we should have, you know, been more on point. But he's a hunting partner anyway. He has bulldogs, he has pit bulls. So, uh, when it comes to the Patterdales, um, are you... Do you chase more of the short-haired dogs? No, I don't. I, 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 I like the wire-haired dogs. And the reason why I like the wire-haired dogs is because... Um, we'll, we'll, we'll go back to nature. When you have an animal that has fluffy hair, um, when, when, when he's attacking or when someone something is you know trying to bite him back, as he's coming in, it, it, it gives them a perception that they're biting, but they're only coming at the hair. So I, I, I think it's more of a, a camouflage thing. That's why I like it. And I also, um, I think that, you know, it, it, as far as the, like the brush and for all the briar and stuff like that, I, I think it works out better also. I, I, I favor those dogs more. Not that I don't like the short hair dogs, but I, I favor the... The, the broken coats and the and um the wire coats more than I do the short haired dogs. Mm. It seems yeah. like they're more hardy also. You know? Especially I see um like I said, a lot of people are trying to breed the, the small little tiny dogs. I personally think they put Chihuahua in them and Yorkie and stuff like that in them to make them smaller. <laughs> because, you know, they more of my fucking investigation and everything. When I was, you know, first getting into, you know, checking out the packs, 
I look at the history of the Patterdales, and I and I say I don't see any of these people in these black and white films with these little short haired, you know, Chihuahua looking chupacabra dog, you know. Hmm. I said all oh, the dogs that I see uh, a pretty stocky, hardy dog that look like they're put into work, you know. So I, I kind of favor that one. I want to, you know, kind of preserve. What, what, what was already there and not change it and try to make it something else, you know? Well, that brings me to my next question. Um, I've heard of the Wren Terrier and a few different people that cross the uh, Pitbull Terrier to the Patterdales and the Yags. Would you ever consider that? For, for personal use, yes. I wouldn't, um, if I can see... If I can do that to uh, and, and see how they work and maybe produce something for you know for, for, the, for, the, for the hunting kennel, but I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't do like some guy do that cross and then they put them out there as pure patterns. But I, I, I do like battle cross dogs. I love battle cross dogs. It just seems like it um it gives them uh they have like a different edge to them somewhat. Hmm. I understand. So, what kind of what kind of things have you learned along the way that maybe most people don't know as far as the care of your animals? Um, medical. You got to be up on the medical all the time. They won't tell you when they're hurt. Like I didn't know my girl. Her eye was lacerated until you know. I checked her out. I know that she had she had some small bite marks, you know. I gave her antibiotics, and, yeah. and you know, I, I, I packed them all up with the the, 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 the quick quad and everything. And but I didn't know her eye she would hurt until she was just whining at night, and I was like, "What's wrong?" You know, I shaved it down, looked at her like, "What's wrong? What's wrong?" And it was her eye. Like you have to constantly, you know, you gotta look over, and look over, and look over. Medical is the number one thing, especially when you have a working dog. They don't tell you when they're hurt because they, they just brush it off like it's nothing. It's nothing. I, I, learned, I learned that right there. I learned um, Patty Dale don't like to drink water. <laughs> That's one thing I'll tell you right now. All oh, my dogs, I put a bowl of water in front of them. Unless they've been out working, they won't touch it. They won't touch it. I can pour water in the dish right now, put ice in and everything. It'd be 120 degrees out here. They'll look at me like there's no meat in that bowl. Right. Now, have you, um... Now, I've heard other breeders and dog men talk about uh, fish penicillin. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I use fish and penicillin. I use that, uh... Occasionally, so that's my first preventative method, method, method when I when I go out. When we go out and we come back, and if they got into any type of squabble with anything, the first thing I do is hit them with that. And once I hit them with that, then I have a vet. I have a vet up the street either, you know, visiting vet, you know, because we a lot of farm labor stuff. So I'll call him and uh, tell him what's up. You know, we get all the all the other good extra stuff from that, but. Um, Definitely got to uh, keep that. It, it's pretty good. You know, you can't let that stuff, you know, get uh, out of expiration date. But uh, it, 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 I use it as my first preventative me me method for uh, when they go out. After they come back in and everything like that, wash them down, you know, flee and kick them, and, um, and, and, and hit them with that amoxicillin. You know what I mean? A nice meal, a nice big meal, some amoxicillin, stuff like that. Uh, what do you use for um, flea and tick preventative? Um, I use neem oil all around the kennel. I spray neem oil. I wipe the whole floor. I wash the floors. Everything with neem oil because uh, they're they're actually allergic to it. They'll break down into hives. And I put they put it on them before. So I use neem oil and that kills everything. And I also use uh, flea oil. It's a big thing I get from uh, tractor trailer supply. I spray that around, and uh, you know I treat all the way outside. I just burn everything. My yard, I burn it. I put down a sofa. I go out there on the day before it rains. I light fires. I burn everything down. No bushes, no grass. You know that's where the fleas get on them and ticks get on them when they get hiding their grass in those bushes. 
So if there's no, there's no grass and bushes for them to, to jump on, or if it's very low, then it, it, it cuts down the, the transmission of those insects mm. real quick. Okay, that makes sense. So neem oil also, and... I also use, um, I'm going to tell you this, I also have a mix of um, essential oils that I use too, like lemongrass, um, cedar wood, um, lavender. I, I, I buy that by the, I believe it's uh, 12 ounces each, and I mix that all with a, um, a mineral oil, and I put that in a spray bottle. So I spray them down. Usually before we go out, I'll spray them down with that. And then after we come in, they get a wash down because that just prevents everything from getting on them initially. Even though they can be smelled, the animal can smell them coming a mile away, I really don't care because they're still going to get it. But um, yeah, I use that as a preventative method before we even go out. Everybody gets soaked down with that stuff. They dry up in the, in the, in the sun or in the heat. And then we go out and when we come back in, they just get a good wash down. How often do you go out with your dogs? Every day I go out. Every day. They, they, they may not catch something every day, but where I, you know, where I live, I have a huge backyard. I have um, a three-mile creek behind us and 65 acres of public land. So when I walk out of my backyard, I can walk into the woods. Okay. So every morning about 5, 30, 6 o'clock, I open those garage doors and they run on those woods. They know what time it is. They go in there and find whatever they can. Armadillos, rabbits, whatever it is. Sometimes it's a long day. Sometimes they get a raccoon and it's, you know, you don't get back home and get breakfast till four o'clock that afternoon. Mm. So walk me through your feed feeding regimen. What do you feed? Oh, I feed raw. Um, everybody, so, uh, my patty deals, my, my pit bulls, they get a little bit more, but my patty deals, they all, every day they get um, two pounds of food. That's split three quarters in a day or one quarter at night. Um, I feed them, it's a, it's a mixture of everything. I give them raw game meat, wild boar. I give them wild deer meat. I give them beef liver. I give them chicken, chicken liver. I give them all types of stuff. We, we, we switch it up on the meats, but I try to give them a variety of meats every day. No, I always kibble. I don't give them kibble. I, um, um, I turn my kibble. My kibble is uh, beans. So I take all my, be all my dry beans and I make big bucket of beans, you know, White beans, black beans, pinto beans, lima beans, uh, fava beans, and I make a nice slurry with some uh, some beef liver gravy, and we get a, a half a cup of that every day with the quarter, with with their meat. Okay. Now I've always heard that uh, wild boar can be very wormy. Is there a certain way you you know prepare that? Well, I try to go for the sour meat because the sour meat is the sweet meat. You know what the so the um, the wild boar boar the, the boar hog is the male, and if they haven't been cut and they have their balls on, they produce a lot of testosterone, and it, and a lot of dogs don't like that. They don't, they they'll come to the meat and they'll smell it and they'll taste it and they, they don't like that. You know, my pit bull they look. But the patty bills, they'll, they'll literally, I've never seen them not eat something, but they only eat that they will, they'll eat it. But, you know, they have to be sitting there for a while and they have to be hungry. But um, that's the thing with the boar meat is um, you have to get the sour meat. The sour meat is the sweet meat. That's the meat that people like, that the dogs like also. If uh, you use the boar meat, it, it's good for the dogs and it, it pumps them up with the sauce room and everything like that. But uh, it seems like they don't take to it as, as well as they do the sound. Okay. Now, but still, there's no you. You give it to them straight raw anyway. Yeah, I give it to them straight raw. So you, you, you have you can purge you. Have, so when I get the hog, I usually purge them a little bit. You know, so I don't deworm them. But uh, say we get a, a year old hog. 
and we catch him and, and, and we, we, we ain't killed him yet, you know what I mean? We just caught him. You take him, you know, you got that, you know, you, you quarantine him and, and, and you purge him out. You give him, you know, table scraps and water. And you let him run around and stuff like that. So by the time he's ready to, to be slaughtered, then, then, you know, you you know you don't have all that. You can, you can go over and look at his poop and you can see if it has worms in it. You know what I mean? You know how to check a dog poop for worms. Same thing with a hog. If you walk over to a hog poop and you look at it, it'll have worms in it. You'll see the worms. It'll like spaghetti. You can tell if it, if it has worms, you know what I mean? But um, I definitely I definitely check with it. But I haven't had any uh, any problems with it right now. If they did have it, I would, I, you know, I would know. But I have never had any tapeworm, but I never had any roundworm or hookworm feeding the wild boar. Never had any of it. And, and, and I also clean, the, clean them really well, too. You know what I mean? Before I even skin them, I wash them down with Dawn dishwasher liquid and bleach. And then I hit them with hot water. So by the time I bust them open, everything that's on the outside is gone. Never contaminates the meat inside. Okay. So, do you have so you have a space where you'll keep a hog until you're ready to use it? Yes, yes, I do. Well, you have to. Well, you, <clears throat> all right. So, where a lot of people don't, I see. Uh, I saw some guys that got busted on um, for, for 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 pig fighting because they didn't have the proper uh, documentation and the proper licensing. The number one thing that I that I do is I make sure I have my hunting license, I make sure I have my trapping license, and then down here in the state of Georgia, you have to have um, what they call a hog facility license and a hog transport license. If you don't have those licenses in order and you get caught, you're getting in trouble. So literally you have to have, if you don't have those things in, in order and you get caught by any game warden or somebody calls and says, hey, they got a hog outside and, and they pull up, you're in trouble. You have to have those things set before you even start doing anything. I got you. Even your, even your hunting license. If you go out with your dog, if I was to go out without a hunting license and without a traffic license and without a, a sportsman license with my dogs, and my dogs are off the leash and hunting. Yeah, I, I believe there was, um, I don't know why I say no um, any uh, 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 name, but there was another kennel that, you know, on YouTube, and uh, he said that the, the lawman shot his dogs, and he would, you know, he had permission to be out there hunting. I, and, I, and I would say, if you have permission to be out there hunting, did you have your hunting license and did you have all the rest of those licenses and stuff in play? Because then you're covered, even though you lost a dog, you know what I mean? You're, you're covered, but you wouldn't be able to charge him with anything. It would just be a bad mistake, you know what I mean? On, on his part for shooting your dog and stuff. You got to make sure you have those things covered, definitely, before you even go out, before you even get into it. You know what I mean? You're doing it for hobby. Make sure you go get a hunting license. Make sure you go get a, a sportsman license so you can be out there with your dogs and have the dogs off the leash. Because even if you're out there with your dogs, you can't have them off the leash unless you're, you know, participating in hunting. Okay, that makes sense. Now, while we're on that topic, um, why don't you explain for the listeners uh, is maybe some further advice on while you're out there, how to protect yourself, how to protect your dogs, things to look out for. What's the procedure when you're out there hunting? Procedure when out there, snake boots and, and the snake boots and, 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 and bees. Those are the two things that's going to uh, gonna cost you all the time. You know, I have uh, smoke grenades, so I, I don't move too fast, you know what I mean? So if bees come at me, I like to smoke in there and try to get away as quick as possible. You know what I mean? And you gotta have snake boots. You gotta watch out for your dogs, the snakes. You have the, the different tools that you're gonna need. You just don't want to send your dog down into a den because it could be an empty den with snakes in it. It could be a, a, a den full of coyotes. You know what I mean? So there's things that uh, you know uh, we call them the the, the open scope. And you can buy them from Home Depot and stuff like that. It's a wire with a 
with a camera on the end, you can stick that down in there and all that type of stuff. There's all types of different things. You got to be prepared with all the tools that you need when you go out there before you go hunting. Just don't go out there with a dog and, 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 and a shovel and think you're hunting. You're going to need way more than that. You're going to need quick stop. You're going to need fucking... Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what, where to get it from, but you don't have to need something that's gonna uh, uh, deter um, the bees or stuff like that. I use smoke bombs. You need spray stuff like that. There's a lot of different things you need when you go out there hunting every day. I have a backpack I throw on my back before I go walk in those woods. The backpack it, it, it stays. Make sure everything's in there. All kinds of stuff in there. Well, I mean. I'm a bug out. I'm a bug out bag man myself, so I, I can yeah, understand not, that. Yeah, bug out bag is what it is. <laughs> bug out bag, but you gotta have a bug out bag for the dog, man. It's with all types of medical things in there. Yeah, I, uh, those, those, those smoke bombs really help me out. You know, coming <laughs> springtime, going up in there, running into a pack of bees. And and, and, and and you're 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 in the thicket of, of, of briar and, 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 and vines and you're trying to get out of there and you can't and they're just lighting you up. You turn around and you take a couple of bites, you like that smoke bomb is gonna save you, you know what I mean? Now those smoke bombs, can you get those off of Amazon or do you get them from tractor supply? Uh no, I I go to the, the, the they're uh, they're meant for um for airsoft. Okay. They're meant for airsoft. You know what I mean? So I, I usually, you know, when I go to the Army Navy store, they have that type of stuff in there. So I go to the Army Navy store and, and rack up on them. They're, but they're meant for airsoft. Those are the ones I use. I got you. So, <clears throat> now, we've, we've talked a lot about the Pats. Now, tell me a little bit more about your pit bulls. My pit bulls? Yeah, what are the uh, what are the bloodlines and stuff? They're um, well, only one of my only my boy. I have, I have two, but only my boy has ever been on any game. He's been on raccoon. He's been on you know small hog. Nothing big. Nothing nothing over a hundred pounds. He's been on because he started out as my brother's house dog. You know down there, but um. You know, I told him I would edge him into it little by little, get him going, you know what I mean? So I'm not going to just take him and throw him into the ring where, you know, uh, Mike Tyson, you know what I mean? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him beat up on a little guy and get his confidence up and see what he does before, you know, I really do anything else. But um, he's more for the breeding program, for, for you know, the lurches and the, and the, and the, and, um, the, um, the hound dog that we want to produce. But... Uh, as far as that, we um we're gonna start a nice program on that. We're gonna start a nice program on that. We are uh, getting everything done. Friend of mine up north, my boy Philip and my boy Keith KTB. He um they they uh they're holding me down up, up north with that, and we have some good stuff going on. Nice. Um, yeah, both man, we uh. I want that. I, I, I kind of moved away from pit bulls because of the, you know, stigma behind them and everything. Mm -hmm. and they, but uh, I'm going to take them and we'll make some like battle across uh, nurture dogs. A lot, a, lot, a lot of deer hounds and stuff like that, deer hound competitions, things like that. You know, my life is all dog. I do dogs every day, all day. So um, right. when I get it, when I, when I start doing that, I'm going to start chasing some chasing some deer and stuff like that. Do you, you know, I like them stag hounds. Do you, uh, do you use any kind of uh, supplements for your dogs? Um, uh, bee pollen, bee jelly. That's basically all the supplements I use. Everything else is all natural. You said bee jelly. What is that? Bee pollen and bee jelly. It's uh, bee pollen. And, you know, bee pollen, when they collect the bee pollen off the... Yeah. Off the, yeah, so... You can buy that in the store, and um, bee jelly is what the bees actually feed the baby bees, okay. and it, it's very high in a lot of nutrients, amino acids. Um, it, it, it's, it's it's basically like giving your dog a, a super vitamin every day. Okay. It's like giving them a super vitamin every day to cover up everything, you know, like that. But, um, I don't use any other supplements. Um, 
got to make sure they have bone marrow every day, bee pollen every day, um, a little bit of green tripe every day. Um, yeah, a lot, you know, they, 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 they're essentials. Okay. Um, let me ask you this, and this is for the listeners and for myself. So, obviously, I'm pretty sure you've seen my band dog program that I just started. Mm -hmm. um, so, I kept the male, actually, I kept the smaller male. Um, I called him Reaper, and he's a very good pup. He follows me everywhere. But I figured, the, you know, based on what you do as far as hunting, because I want... I want him to be a survival dog, in essence. Basically, man-focused, uh, animal-focused, whatever I need him to do. Um, so I figure this could benefit the, the listeners as well. What would be some of the things you would tell me to do while he's eight weeks old? You want him to be man-focused, then? Um, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to accomplish here is... Um, the dog that I leash up with my bug out bag, when, obviously not really zombies, but when they say, when the zombies come, you know, as, obviously everybody knows that that's pretty much a joke when you say that, but it's, you know, the, the collapse of the dollar, uh, another Hurricane Katrina. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things that we, we could smell coming, so, <clears throat> you deal a lot in hunting, and... That perks my ears up because I'm like, okay, hunting will really show where a dog is at, where, where you know what level of balls the dog has. So at eight weeks old, and I'm confident in his parents as far as good stock to start with. Although I do plan on outcrossing to some other stuff, like like I said before, I'm I'm not gonna limit myself. But what would you say to a guy that has an eight week old pup? And he has high hopes. What would be some of the things you would start off one of your pit bulls or patterdales doing to make sure, you know, to, to stack the odds in their favor? Number one thing is call back. If you're going to have a dog that's going to be running with you as a bug out dog, he has to be able to listen. You got to be able to listen. He has to be hard on listening. Remember that, remember that movie with Will Smith and how he had that dog? Uh, you're talking about... Um, uh, I am legend. I am legend. Yeah, I am legend. You see how that dog was? Yeah. Came back, and that, those are the things you want to work on. Constantly keep that dog. Even if he's eight weeks old, he go over there and play call. He go over there and play call. Every five minutes, he's doing something, call. And they can come to you. Another thing, too, is don't let him play with nobody else. You won't trust nobody but you and your people. No one else touches or talks to the dog. That's it. Isolation. He's all yours. No one else pets him. No one else gives him kisses but you. No one else gives him snacks but you. He don't sleep in the bed with nobody but you and your family. That's it. Nobody. Nobody. That's it. Well, and what do you think? Uh, also, feed a regimen. Always fast. Every now and then. Don't give him no food all day. This water. Both of y'all do the same thing. He does what you do. Don't let him see you eating and sitting there like, oh, I can't eat. Nah, y'all all go out and y'all just drink water and work out all day. And you come in and you lay down and you go to sleep. And then wake up tomorrow morning and, 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 and give him something. Every now and then it's back to dog. Because in the situation where you're going to be out in the woods or where he's going to be lost, you don't want him to be the one who's going to be looking and begging for food. If he gets lost, he's going to run behind the coyote. He's like, who are you? I want to be your friend. Can you give me some food? Nah. Listen, you can do without the food until you can, you know, find out where you're supposed to be. It's what you want to do. You want to, you want to give him those uh, situations to where they're independent, but they're not independent. If you understand what I'm saying? Sure. So where they, um, and they understand what's going to, you know, that, that everything's not going to be, you know, I wake up and get that big, big, huge meal this morning and I get rubbed up and everything like that, you know. Sleep on the ground sometimes. 
You don't always sleep on the rug or in the bed or in the kennel. Sometimes you outside sitting on the stairs. I sleep outside with my dogs. I sit on these front stairs right here and fall asleep in the chair and wake up and there's six, seven dogs around my feet, you know? Yeah, on but- the hard ground and got bit up by bugs and everything. You know what I mean? So you want to change up their environment and their situation all the time. You don't always want them to be comfortable. You don't want them to always be fucking content. You want to, you know, challenge them in more way than just the game. Yeah, but... You want to challenge them mentally, you know? I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that at eight, eight weeks, right? Eight weeks old? Take your dog and sit outside? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm talking about... Um, no, I'm talking about the fat. I'm talking about the fasting part. Oh, the fasting part? Nah. You, you, you don't want to fast them. No, not eight weeks. But you still want to, you know, change up his feeding schedule. Instead of feeding them every day at motherfucking 8 o'clock in the morning, you say, oh, I'm going to push it back to 9.30. Right. Or you wake up one day and you feed them at 7. And, you know, you switch it up like that, you know. Don't 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 do not do that to a young dog because, you know, you'll, you'll mess up his uh, metabolism and growth rate and everything like that. No. But as far as, the, but you can, you can fast them like that, you know, as far as, like, switching up his uh, feeding schedule and stuff like that. So at yeah. what point do you think? Maybe maybe six months, give them, a, give them a day fast? Yeah, absolutely. Six months, give them a day fast, take them on a road trip or something, see how they are in the car. You want to change up the stimulation. All, all, everything you stimulate them with, you want to change it up. You want to give them every type of stimulation you can. Every kind of stimulation you can. Okay. Being around people and not getting no attention. It's hard for puppies not to get attention. So when you're around a whole bunch of people and he's looking like, hey, hey, look at me, I'm a cute little puppy. Everybody ignores him. He builds up his confidence in you more and he builds up, you know, who he is. He's like, all right, fuck them, I don't want to deal with them. You know what I mean? Mm. Become more independent. 